Okay, look, I think we might make a start. Welcome everybody to this Making Public History seminar about infectious disease and public health, lessons from history. I'm Al Thompson from History at Monash, which is one of the co-hosts of the Making Public History webinar series together with the History Council of Victoria and the Old Treasury Building Museum. And these seminars are now, I think, in their 12th year, uh, although for the last year we've been on Zoom and we hope one day to be back to face-to-face. -face. Let me just start, first of all, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many lands on which we meet today. The Making Public History team recognises the long history and significant cultural heritage of the tra traditional owners. I'm speaking today from the lands of the Wurundjeri peoples in the inner north of Melbourne, and our presenters are from other parts of the Kulin Nation, but also up in New South Wales. We pay our respects to elders past and present of these lands and extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and First Nations peoples. So welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. Just briefly, let me just explain a little bit about uh, this webinar and how it works. Most of you by now are probably very familiar with Zoom and possibly also with Zoom webinars. The key thing for those of you who are participants is that unlike a Zoom meeting, only the presenters and the hosts can be seen and heard. Uh, we're gonna be working, I'll introduce the speakers in a moment, and, uh, but each speaker will have up to 15 minutes and then we'll have five minutes of Q&A for that individual speaker. And there'll be 20 minutes, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end for a Q&A with the full panel to draw together the themes of the discussion. So if as a, as a participant, uh, um, participant, you've got any questions of the presenters as we're going along, please use the Q&A button that you'll find at the bottom of your screen to post your questions. And uh, my colleagues, Alicia Soretto and Susie Prochke are managing the Q&A and Alicia will be hosting the five minute Q&A after every, each presenter and Susie will be hosting the Q&A at the end. Um, just to let you know that if you have any techie issues, use the chat button at the bottom of the screen and we'll be keeping an eye on that as well, just in case. Um, and we've got another colleague of, who's hosting, Margie Anderson from Old Treasury Building, checking that out. And if hopefully we'll be able to help you out if you have any technical problems. If the Wi-Fi begins to get wobbly for one of our presenters, I'll ask them to mute their video because that should usually make it better. Uh, I should also say that we're recording this webinar tonight. Um, the recording will be available on the History Council of Victoria uh, website in a few days time. All the presenters have given permission for recording and we'll assume that our participants also uh, give permission. But if you're asking a question in the Q&A and you don't wanna be identified, just please say so with your question and then we won't identify you when we read out the question. And of course, please keep your questions polite and respectful as I'm sure you will. So I think at that point, I'm gonna stop my share and uh, while Guy then shares his screen, if Geraldine and Warwick, actually, let me just introduce briefly, I'll do longer introductions, but we've got three presenters, Guy Gel Geltner from Monash, Geraldine Feller from Monash and Warwick Anderson from the University of Sydney. And I'll do a, a, a bit more of an introduction to each of them before each of their presentations. So if Geraldine and Warwick, you can now mute your screens uh, and let me introduce Guy who's a social historian of health, cities and punishment at Monash University and at the University of Amsterdam. Very pleased to have welcomed Guy to Melbourne. He managed to get here despite all the travails of the last year. And you'll find a link to Guy's work uh, on the, the website link for this seminar. So Guy, if you'd like to share your screen and I will then mute my video and over to you. So welcome and, and thank you. And Guy's gonna be talking about public health in the pre-modern world, the end of an oxymoron. Thank you, Al. Um, just, is that okay? Can we, um, can you see me and hear me okay, Al? As, okay, great. Um, so thank you again um, for the invitation and everyone for joining. Uh, I'd like to begin also by acknowledging the Kulin people and all First Nations on whose lands um, I live and work and recognize their elders, uh, past, present, and emerging. Um, at the very outset of the current pandemic, a veteran New York Times science reporter provocatively asked readers to go medieval on COVID. 
he argued that introducing seemingly, seemingly retrograde quarantine measures and travel restrictions may soon become a decent price to pay as compared with allowing modern biomedicine to fight the coronavirus all on its own. After all, during the AIDS epidemic's first 30 years, Cuba confined its HIV positive population in pleasant camps and lost 2,500 people. New York City waited for retrovirals and of a similar sized population, 78,000 people died. There was also the more recent success of China's containment strategy, which involved rigid regulation, um, regulations on movement. China's identification as a cultural other, at least for the New York Times readership, meant it was easy to frame as medieval, that is backwards, brutal, and authoritarian, yet somehow producing undeniably better health outcomes. Was this perhaps something worth considering? In the United States, the answer was a resounding no. National travel restrictions were scarce and quarantine non-existent. Even as hundreds of thousands of lives were lost, getting people to go medieval remained a hard sell. Elsewhere, however, and not least here in Australia, the appreciation for um, simple forms of disease prevention peaked. And with this shift in consciousness, a greater openness to learn uh, how deep some prophylactic traditions ran. Either that or uh, Al ran of good ideas. At any rate, the Middle Ages were beginning to look less gloomy and backwards as public health was rightly understood um, uh, to be also about culture and politics and not, and not uh, only the triumph of advanced medicine and statistics. The shift dovetailed with historians' growing insights about how earlier civilizations managed health risks. Travel bans, um, health passports, and physical distancing were certainly part of such programs. But so were other low-tech solutions, um, such as industrial zoning to reduce air and water pollution, elaborate canal networks to supply people with water, hydraulic energy, and um, a way to remove waste, quality control of produce coming into and being sold at local markets and inns, salaried public doctors, and health boards to identify certain disease carriers, such as lepers. This, of course, alongside church-sponsored institutions such as almshouses, hospitals, and leprosaria, labor safety uh, promoted by guilds, and general policing to reduce violence and alleviate fear. There were, in short, many eyes on communal health and safety. The most significant book to date on pre-modern public health was published by British historian Carol Rockliffe in 2013. It built on, as well as stimulated, historians and archeologists working on different world regions and eras. So what I'd like to do in the remaining minutes is to trace the contours of the emerging picture, both before and after the Black Death struck in the mid 14th century. This inclusive uh, periodization is important because that pandemic remains wrongly understood as the singular trigger for preventative measures before the modern era. So whether you're curious about the deeper history of public health, seeking inspiration on how to move forward today, or are simply big fans of Monty Python, here is some food for thought. To understand the deeper history of public health, we need to look at infrastructures. Whether these were shared or private resources, Amenities such as water and road networks, wells, drains, and sinks for waste focused people's hygienic attention. Their success or failure was commonly understood as having an uh, impact on communities' well being. When the residents of Brussels, Bologna, or Baghdad complained to local officials about a broken latrine, for example, they often made recourse to the era's prevalent medical paradigm that is Galenism or humoral theory. They claimed that the exposed sewage 
risk generating miasma, a corruption of the air that could harm anyone living nearby. Or using another common etiology, they claim that stagnant corrupted matter could cause humoral imbalance and thus ill health merely by being seen or smelled. Biomedicine, of course, has other explanations for why such uh, exposures are harmful. But having different etiologies did not stop earlier societies from devising and enforcing plans to fight disease. Moreover, the preventative measure, measures they developed shaped social relations, informed um, concepts of civic duty, and they also created more room for what became the state to expand into. So like any mayor with a Twitter account today, earlier governments too were eager to present themselves as promoters of public health. Here, for example, is a snapshot of all environmental offenses reported by Bologna's fungal or dirt official across the 13th and 14th century. The office was responsible for developing the city's public works. And in so doing, it also monitored and, public and punished behaviors in and around such amenities uh, seen to threaten public health and safety. The Fungo Tribunal, whose records have come down to us, reveals wide-scale mobilization, pro maiori sanitate hominum, for the greater health of people, which became their official mandate well before the Black Death. While uniquely well-preserved, as you can see from one of the images here, such records and the office in general were common across the Italian peninsula. Um, and as numerous historians have shown, they had parallels farther afield. For instance, throughout the vast Islamic world, a muhtasib or market inspector oversaw many aspects of urban hygiene. Nor were such efforts limited to cities. Anywhere people gathered in groups, whether to feast, fight, conduct business, or travel, they addressed the health risks they faced, how to provide themselves with adequate food, how to cope with inclement weather, how to avoid illness, how to dispose of waste, and how to keep fire at bay are questions that they constantly ask themselves. And it's sometimes infuriating to think that we just assume that other people didn't. It is therefore remarkable, but upon reflection, not so surprising that so much prophylactic uh, knowledge was created on the move and not in cities, including in Aboriginal birthing camps. Earlier society's medical paradigm differed greatly from that of biomedicine, but the absence of germ theory and microscope microscopes, not to mention representative democracies, hardly stopped them from being proactive about fighting disease and promoting their health. Sometimes they failed, even miserably. But as the last year has proven strongly, I think, having excellent resources is no guarantee for adequate science, let, uh, let alone political will to overcome a pandemic. If we can come to terms with the fact that public health has more moving parts to it than biomedical science and more targets than pandemics, our approach to public health and its rich history um, is bound to change. Absent a few uh, very enthusiastic monks, no medieval community I am aware of willingly sought to live short, brutish, and nasty lives. But societies certainly differed in the resources at their disposal, the values that bound them together, and the leadership that saw them through times of crisis. In that, they all pursued public health as, a, uh, as an integral, as integral aspect of their common good. And if so, perhaps we never stopped being medieval. Thank you. And I look forward to your questions and the other papers. Thank you, Guy. That's wonderful. I'm going to now just hand over to my colleague, Alicia Sareto from the History Council of Victoria, who's going to chair five minutes or so. In fact, you've got a little bit longer if you want, because Guy kept very much to time uh, a Q&A. So over to you, Alicia. Thanks, Al. So 
uh, lots of you will know this, but there's a button down the bottom there for the Q&A. You can enter your name or enter anonymous and send us through a question and I'll pass it on to Guy for you. But to, to kick things off, thank you Guy for taking us on that tour. And um, I was struck by that notion of, you know, 12 months ago, people calling for us to go medieval on COVID um, and that it was a decent price to pay alongside the, the you know, medical advances that we have. Um, but do you think, do people listen to historians when it comes to public health? I think people listen to, to statistics and um, mm. as uh, even that op-ed, which was controversial for various reasons, uh, pointed out, um, we, 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 can, we can look back to, you know, the, the AIDS epidemic um, provided us with, uh, with uh, you know, at least, at least food for thought as, you know, as did what we were getting, what we were getting out of China. Um, I don't think people listen enough to historian, but of course I'm, uh, I'm biased. Um, yes. And I, I think there's another aspect to it, as I've been discussing with many colleagues and my students, uh, my colleague Paula Michaels and I are now teaching a course on people called People in Plagues. And it's something to also, it's not only about the medicine or the biomedicine, I think it's a lot of it has to do with social memory. And I think we've experienced it here in Melbourne and it was typical that different communities, uh, uh, you know, share very different perceptions and memories of how uh, health crises were dealt with uh, in the past, wherever they came from, whoever they are. And I think that governments uh, and whoever is, um, you know, rolling out preventative programs or curative programs really has to take that into consideration if we want people to really understand and make informed decisions about what they're complying with, what they're participating in. Um, and I think that in that sense, historians of the recent and not so recent past have a lot to, um, uh, to say, as do anthropologists, of course. Yes, so not just you know, the statistics often do speak to people, but reminding them of that, of that social memory and, and what people have done in the past. Right. And as we know, statistics um, in, in, in global health, a lot of statistics are really uh, gathered by uh, Western medical professionals, mm. often on the basis of Western uh, populations. Mm. So we need to take that into account too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've had a couple of questions here um, and going back to the medieval, um, there's a question here that the New York Times approach seems to suggest that going medieval means going for extremes of constraint and regulation. Do you think that medieval cultural forms of public health were extremely constraining and to what extent were there more negotiated elements and norms of a voluntary nature? Uh, um, that's a great question. Uh, of course, I um, I um, I use that that medieval. I would use within double quotation marks because it itself is a deep misunderstanding of what medieval public health or pre modern public health was uh, was like. Of course, it was negotiated. Of course, there were different stakeholders. You know, putting the different medical paradigm aside, which was very important. Um, no um, uh, state or centralized political authority then as now can um, you know uh, engage in biopolitics at, at, at it on its own terms mm. and therefore a lot absolutely and as I pointed out more towards well it was a short presentation but at some point I pointed out that the um, uh, rolling out or, or, or nudging of people into certain kinds of uh, uh, positive uh, uh, health outcome be behaviors, you know, neighborhoods were doing it, individuals were doing it, um, mm -hmm. guilds were doing it, the church was doing it. So there were a lot of people who, or a lot of stakeholders that were active in, um, in, in that. And the second point I made about the understanding of medieval um, is that it did not begin and end, or certainly did not begin with the um, terrible uh, uh, strike or onset of Black Death, which is usually people with a kind of a benign mm. approach to the Middle Ages say, well, at least they had Black Death. So it's, you know, they woke up from their slumber and sort of started locking people up to, to do stuff. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I think there you've answered, there was a question about quarantine type, how early were quarantine type actions taken by individuals, communities and officials? Is there anything more you wanna say about that? Well, quarantine, again, it de depends on how you, you define it, but we do have uh, mm. evidence for quarantine in the uh, general uh, um, uh, uh, sense of it from the 12th century, but the earliest documented quarantine facility um, for ships coming in, um, uh, so out, right outside port, comes from Dubrovnik and I think it's 1377. Mm. Uh, but it's by no means the first time that the notion of isolating people who are suspected of carrying some sort of uh, disease was a, a practice. And I speak only of my, in my familiarity with Western European history, I assume that that is different for other regions. And now uh, I think our last question for our, our question time now is, um, has the differing response to COVID not so much been modern versus medieval as the relative role of health officers relative to politicians, say mm. Australia compared with UK, US, Europe? Uh, I think that that is definitely um, uh, uh, a more accurate way to think. Um, it's and and I wouldn't even limit it just to the role of health officers. I mean, health officers can be dictatorial too, uh, or or pursue their own you know professional uh, um, you know political interests. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we've we've experienced very different forms of cultural identity. Um, and management of resources and, um, uh, of, you know, different things played very different roles in, in different countries and uh, whether there was an election there or not. Um, and so um, uh, I'm, I'm also not for uh, uh, saying that, that in times of crisis, we need to go to a one particular expert because as we all have learned, health crises, don't get resolved by science. They get resolved by politics and culture. And to believe, I think it's also dangerous to believe that non-elected official, non-elected experts um, will have all of the solutions all, all of the time. So mm. my personal opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Guy, for um, speaking to us and, and answering those questions. Thanks to everyone for your questions too and look forward to the group discussion at the end likewise thank you thank you thank you guy and alicia and uh if guy if you could mute your screen and warwick you can join us and then i'll introduce great here's warwick look i'm delighted to welcome warwick anderson who is speaking to us from sydney warwick md phd so brings a, a a pretty impressive set of credentials is, is Janet Dora Hine, Professor of Politics, Governance and Ethics in the Department of History and the Charles Perkins Centre at the University of Sydney. And Warwick's also an honorary professor in the School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne. And Warwick's going to talk to us today about Crisis in the Herd, a short history of R0 and disease modelling. And he may well correct my pronunciation of R0, but thank you for joining us, Warwick, and look forward to hearing this talk. Uh, thanks, Al. Uh, R zero is the American pronunciation, so we probably should say R naught uh, over here, although I'm not sure. Uh, yes, I should say, first of all, that um, I'm speaking to you tonight from the uh, uh, lands of the Wangal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay respect to their elders, past and present. Now, uh, I'm afraid I don't have any slides to entertain you, just a talking head tonight, but I want to say a few words uh, today about how we might do history in a pandemic, what it would mean to think through the history of the present. Now, admittedly, history of the present is a, an overused phrase, it's almost banal, but I'm referring here to uh, Michel Foucault's original formulation. Foucault was arguing that historians uh, should try to uncover hidden genealogies and alternative pasts, traces of history that might disturb our views of the present. It's not unlike the popular television show, Who Do You Think You Are? 
uh, was once thought simple and unified becomes uh, far more diverse and unsettled. That's what I want to begin to do today. I'm looking at something about the pandemic that we've come to take for granted and showing how historically strange and limited it really is, how it might be otherwise. I'm referring to contemporary disease modelling, uh, ideas about R0 or R0. Uh, that's the basic reproduction rate of the virus, which indicates transmissibility. Ideas about flattening the curve or getting R0 below one. And uh, now the achievement of herd immunity. Modelling, modelling tells us when to lock down and whether to don masks, socially distance or sanitise. We've learned to understand the COVID-19 pandemic largely through disease models and simulations. But this way of framing a disease outbreak is historically quite peculiar. I'm tempted to say unprecedented, though perhaps not quite. Uh, while it's a relatively new conceptual tool or mode of coming to judgment in a crisis, disease modeling does have a history, uh, revealing and somewhat disconcerting history, I think. There's no doubt the pandemic has flushed out a gaggle of historians of medicine, all eager uh, to help us understand the current predicament. Uh, many of these historians have tried to dig deep into their knowledge of different diseases and different times in order to make sense of COVID-19. Accordingly, we're told COVID-19 is a lot like cholera or smallpox or AIDS or Ebola or more prom promisingly uh, influenza or SARS. Such a, a rush to appear useful is of course commendable, but many of these historical analogies fail to advance our knowledge of the way we live now. Some have obscured more than they revealed. A few historians, including me, warned that each epidemic makes its own history, that each is spe specific, contingent on the circumstances of the time. Thus, there are no simple lessons to be read from histories of past pandemics. But then again, other historians remind us it's possible to discern recurrent patterns in the ways in which societies have comprehended and responded to epidemic diseases. Variations, at least on a common theme, if you like a fluid dramaturgy or a flexible repertoire. As we can learn something about our perceptions of COVID-19 and our reactions to the disease from history, so long as we're willing to engage closely and critically with our contemporary situation. To take advantage of history, then, we need first to think sociologically and ecologically about our current predicament, to examine history in the making, not only history already done, which uh, brings me back to the history of the present. In the short time I have available today, I, I, I can merely signal what such a history might be. Uh, let me start with an incident, incident in Melbourne in March last year. Australia's Chief Medical Officer, Brendan Murphy, went to bed the night before the Melbourne Grand Prix, assured it was safe to run the motor race. Only on waking early to be told by the Doherty Institute modelers that inputs or parameters of the, of the model had changed overnight requiring the event to be cancelled within hours. Unlike other jurisdictions, Australia has fastidiously followed the science and submitted to modelling, so stopped it was. There can be a few other examples where models with such obscure predicates and designs have become so publicly compelling and conceptually hegemonic, such influential instruments of governance in a crisis. In April, 2020, when the Doherty Institute modelling was belatedly released to the public, epidemiologist Tony Blakely praised the analysis for demonstrating that physical distancing is essential to flatten the curve enough to avoid ICU overload. But he warned that models could oversimplify social interactions. Later that year, James McCourt, a former physicist and now modeller at the Doherty Institute, told readers of the Australian newspaper 
that models can replace hunches and intuitions with numbers, parameters, and equations. But they can never capture all relevant factors, especially those that shape social relations. Disease models, like the one used to justify the prolonged Victorian lockdown, McCaw wrote, are only as good as their inputs and assumptions. But as Premier Dan Andrews said, you can't argue with that sort of data. You can't argue with science. So disease modeling has a history. There is probably no more legitimate use of the instrument of statistics, wrote British public health expert, Arthur Ransom in 1867, than its application to the study of epidemic diseases. Some 30 years later, after demonstrating that mosquitoes transmit malaria parasites, tropical medicine pioneer Ronald Ross conducted a series of statistical studies of malaria control, properly introducing quantitative modeling, quantitative modeling into epidemiology, the statistics of disease, and he called this pathometry. An ecological, one might almost say multi-species mindset shaped his investigation of transmission dynamics and control, though his disease models lack sociological complexity, depending instead on a simplistic racial typology to explain human behavior. Like so many others in tropical medicine, Ross became obsessed with insect-human interactions, with measuring malaria transmission entomologically by mosquito density, at the expense of any nuanced understanding of the sociality and cultures of human populations. In the early 20th century, Alfred Lotka, a statistician for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, elaborated on Ross's disease models, introducing from demography, from human population studies, the notion of net reproduction rate per generation, or net fertility, a fundamentally Malthusian parameter. In the 1950s, George MacDonald, the director of the Ross Institute of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine also would turn his attention to the mathematical theory of malaria transmission on the eve of the International Eradication Program. MacDonald borrowed Lotka's demographic concept of the basic reproduction ratio for the disease, calling it in a 1955 paper uh, Z0, or Z0, I guess, meaning the number of hosts in a susceptible population expected to be infected by a single already infected host. Interestingly, MacDonald focused on the benefits of DDT in reducing transmission, in lowering what later became known as R0, that is in flattening the curve. As you can see then, disease modeling is a story of how mosquitoes briefly became humans and humans lastingly became mosquitoes. As epidemiologist Gideon Meyerowitz Katz admits, even the best, most sophisticated models can only take the first steps in the tangled web of interconnectivity that we call society. It wasn't until the 1970s that Roy Anderson and Australian former physicist Robert May, together in Britain, truly po popularized the concept of intrinsic or basic reproduction rate, along with the symbol R0 applying it more widely to other infectious diseases, including contagious ones. The first question that ecologists ask of a virus, May could write by 1993, is what is its basic reproductive rate? What is its fitness? Anderson and May, along with yet another former physicist, uh, Neil Ferguson, who's now responsible for the Imperial College models of COVID-19 in Britain, set about modeling bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease, and a subsequent outbreak of foot and mouth disease among the national herd. As sociologist John Law reflected, a simple but opaque epidemiological technology was used to draw an unnecessarily alarmist line through the animal collective. Ferguson and colleagues later applied these density dependent models, slightly modified, to simulate epidemics of influenza and SARS among humans, and now COVID-19. I've written about the recent history of disease modeling in Britain, so I won't elaborate here, but I, I want to draw your attention to this genealogy of the type of epidemiological reasoning 
that also informed last year's Victorian lockdown. The narrow parameters and simplifications of such modeling historically have made many experts uneasy. The concept of contact or social interaction in the models can appear misleadingly facile, lacking in context, as if there's no such thing as society. The models assume a relatively homogeneous collective or herd where virus transmission depends on undifferentiated contact or population density. In other words, the models are concerned with contamination or contact without context, not with the social configurations and relations that might modulate transmission. In thus being treated as a herd, people find that the scope of social life, its range of potentialities, gets constricted and homogenized and they feel ever more alienated and excluded from decision-making. Modeling makes certain population policies and subject positions conceivable, even necessary, at the same time as it manages to give the illusion of depoliticizing debate, silencing other voices and alternative imaginations of the future. Thus, modeling further reduces the room to maneuver in a crisis, enacting a performance of calculation and control. To be sure, we may need to model our way out of a crisis to make abstractions work for us, to get busy with the pandemic. But must our models be so circumscribed and limited, their performance so inhibiting? Can we turn to history to aid in reconstituting the crisis as a more encompassing and ambient subject of knowledge, permitting greater sociological and biological complexity and nuance? and thereby affording more room to maneuver. Can a critical history help us to rethink our models, to socialize or de-herd or ecologize them? Just to be clear, I'm alluding to a history of the present crisis, not in order to reject modeling, but rather to imagine it otherwise. I'd like to use history not to debunk modeling, but to think about how it might be assembled differently. I hope that this sort of particular history of one aspect of the pandemic or the present pandemic allows a sort of uh, a sort of constructive critique as Bruno Latour advises a gathering or assembling of ever more subjects and participants the crafting of matters of concern for lessons however you have to look elsewhere thanks thank you Warwick that's just fascinating uh, let me again welcome back Alicia Sereta, who's going to share this Q&A with Warwick. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Warwick, for taking us through all of that. Um, I, I feel like, you know, like, like any big event, um, I don't know about if it's everywhere in the world, but we feel like we become experts. When the Olympics on, we become experts at diving. Did the general public think they became experts at modeling and reading those numbers? Well, I don't think they became, felt they were ever experts at um, modeling. I think they felt a bit left out of the modeling and, it, and right. there, there were numerous criticisms from within medicine and public health about mm. the lack of transparency of the modeling and the, uh, Difficulties parametizing, apparently, is the, the verb, uh, okay. parametizing uh, uh, various um, uh, uh, more complex social factors. But of course, you know, aside from not being included in the modeling, everyone did become an expert of one sort or another. Uh, everyone uh, had an opinion about epidemiology. Even people in public health who really don't do much epidemiology came forward as experts mm. uh, when they weren't. So that, that is true. There was this uh, sense, but I'm not just sort of, I'm not saying let's really treat these, you know, the, everyone as an expert. What I'm saying is that we, we need experts. We need uh, modelers, but uh, we, uh, and, and they still need to be able to do the technical uh, tasks necessary and to work out how to get these models to function in, in the real world. But what I'm saying is that the, uh, the input into this, the, this process should be much more open and, uh, and uh, 
more um, diverse and heterogeneous. There are so many, I mean, I remember uh, when the, uh, there was an outbreak in the Housing Commission flats in North Melbourne and Flemington. Mm. And, uh, and people, everyone, the experts said, we just don't know what goes on there. <laughs> we don't know what goes on there. So we don't know how these things are transmitted. Uh, well, you know, there are yeah. social scientists, uh, sociologists, anthropologists, all sorts of people. Uh, who actually do know, yeah. have, and the people who live there do know what's going on. And so somehow it, it's very difficult to make these things quantitative, but there must be, I think, more of an effort. And, and most of them, most modelers recognise this as a problem too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I suppose Christine's got that question, is the restrictive paradigm of current modelling the result of asking the wrong questions in traditional statistic collection? Well, I think it's actually, uh, yes, it is perhaps asking the wrong questions or looking mm. for answers in the wrong places, perhaps. Um, yeah. uh, the, the, you know, a lot of criticism early uh, on was that uh, the models weren't ecologically nuanced. In fact, they didn't deal with interspecies relations and certainly the, the models of the emergence of the virus. Mm. Um, but I think actually that wasn't the real problem. Uh, the real problem was that uh, uh, it was a sociological impoverishment and cultural impoverishment of these models. And this has been a, a problem in um, uh, epidemiology, but more generally in disease ecology uh, uh, for the last century, actually, that people are not so bad at introducing some sort of biological complexity but when it comes to human populations, uh, we're seen more as a sort of undifferentiated herd still. And there's mm. not that sort of uh, effort to uh, look at the different social and cultural configurations that may be shaping transmission. Yeah. And um, Andrew's going back to the, the decision to stop the 2020 Grand Prix at such short notice. and. He's asking, do you imagine the decision being made differently? Do you criticise that decision? Well, uh, no, uh, this is, uh, yeah, I, I've been very careful uh, over the last year and more, really, not to criticise these decisions uh, because, um, for one thing, we don't really know what was really happening. I mean, it would be easier to perhaps to criticise them if there was more transparency. Mm. Um, uh, but um, uh, and there is more I do know about that decision that, that I am not prepared to talk about at this point. Very good. Uh, but the um, but look, I, I think that um, uh, uh, I mean it's interesting, isn't it? Because we're, I'm saying let's try to imagine a history of the present, historicise our mm. present, and to think. And provide alternative genealogies, you know, the other ways of doing things from the past that might include, uh, you know, overcoming these sort of uh, the narrowness in the formulation of these models. Uh, if one once one sees it historically, one can see how narrowly they're conceived, um, and uh, and that's because of the way they've developed over time. Mm. Um, and that's the point I'm making. It doesn't mean that one should, uh, as the pandemic goes on, uh, become uh, a critic in trying to debunk them. I think what one needs to do is try to make them more complex. Yeah. In a sense, to you know, to care for the models, to provide uh, more nurturing for the models, mm. you know, put more into the models, make them more uh, uh, robust, and uh, all at the same time as more robust, more nuanced, yeah. and realistic, just realistic, in fact. Mm. Mm. So I hesitate to be critical. I mean, I know, I mean, my interest in modelling began at that point um, when Brendan Murphy um, woke up and it was told that the models changed, yeah. shut it down immediately. Yeah. Um, because uh, around that, that week, I was talking to an old friend of mine who's one of the chief health officers. Uh, in one of the states and uh, and he said to me you know he said when this is over somebody should write about a critical history of disease modeling yeah 
And so maybe this is a little, a little premature for me to be starting it now, but uh, <laughs> uh, but I think uh, uh, yeah, I think that uh, it, it, it's good to reflect on it now and perhaps to build on it after the mm. pandemic, um, so that the next time round we do better. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think that that key point you're saying about about nuance and building a better model is is key there. And we have got a couple of other questions, but we'll hold hold them over till the end. Um, thanks so much, Warwick, and um, thanks to everyone for your questions. And here comes Al. Thank you, Warwick. So, and thanks, Alicia. Um, I can see some fascinating questions for us to come back to. But uh, uh, Geraldine, if you'd like to share your screen and unmute your video. And while you're doing that, I'll introduce Geraldine Feller, who's in the final year of her PhD candidature at Monash, where her thesis examines the experiences of HIV and AIDS nurses in Australia prior to the introduction of antiretroviral therapy. Geraldine's research looks at the intersection of oral history, labour history, histories of gender and sexuality, and social movement studies. And Geraldine's wonderful title is From Condom Man to Community Control, Indigenous Public Health, Nursing and HIV in the 1980s. Geraldine, are you having trouble with your slides or are you okay? I am having a bit of trouble. It was trouble okay before you, you had them up. Do you want to just try sharing screen again? Yeah, I might just do that. Um, so the issue is I'm not able to move between the slides like I was before. Um, um, all right. Give it one more go. Give it one more go and then. Let's see. Oh, sorry. Sorry about okay. this everyone. Right. Don't so, worry, Geraldine, we're in good time. I'm just going to, um, one more little go. That looks good. Yep, and we might just have to leave it like okay. that. Does that That's work? fine. All okay, right. welcome, Geraldine, and over to you. Thanks, Al, and um, yeah, thanks for those fascinating papers. It's um, yeah, two two very hard acts to follow. Um, so I might be doing what Warwick's just uh, warned us not to do, which is to take too many lessons from previous pandemics and apply them to our um, contemporary situation, but hopefully can navigate it um, in a way that is um, nuanced and, 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 and helpful and interesting for people. So in March of 2020, as Australia slowly came to grips with the frightening reality of the COVID-19 virus, the remote Aboriginal community of Borrelula in the Northern Territory organised a petition and successfully closed the community to fly in, fly out or FIFO workers who worked the nearby mine. And this was replicated in communities across the country who welcomed family and relatives home and then swiftly closed to tourists and visitors. Amid growing panic and anxiety from government and the medical fraternity over what this new virus could mean for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, um, these communities themselves took decisive action. In both urban and rural areas, they protected the sick and the vulnerable. Aboriginal run health services and community centres organised home visits, food deliveries and COVID safe health consults to protect vulnerable members uh, of the community and in particular a generation of old people, leaders and keepers of important cultural knowledge. And to date, not a single Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person has died of COVID-19 in Australia. And there's a thread of continuity between this response in 2020 and what I'm going to speak about today, which is the successful response of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to the threat of HIV and AIDS in the 1980s and 1990s. Both show the capacity of Indigenous communities to organise and take control of their health and the power of community control and self-determination to transform health outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And just like we saw in 2020, in the 1980s and 1990s, healthcare professionals were predicting an HIV epidemic of catastrophic proportions in remote Aboriginal communities. 
Prominent doctors like Fred Hollows and infectious disease experts like Frank Bowden look to the high incidence of other sexually transmitted diseases in these communities and theorize that they would mimic the so-called African model of disease spread, that is widespread heterosexual transmission. In the course of my research, I kept coming across clippings uh, with quotes from people like Hollows and Bowden predict predicting this catastrophic spread. Um, but with the benefit of, of hindsight that, that historians have, I knew that this spread did not eventuate. And I became curious as to why or how this potential disaster had been averted. And today what I wanna go into um, is some of the insights that I've gained through archival research uh, and in particular, uh, the generously shared oral testimony of nurse and activist Arnie Graceland Smallwood. Um, and these insights, um, I think, uh, you know, Get, sorry, this, um, this evidence is quite a fascinating insight into the successful public health response that was led by Indigenous communities and that defied the predictions of these eminent physicians. Um, so Arnie Graceland Smallwood uh, is a proud Birigubba, Kalkadoon and South Sea Islander woman, a registered nurse, community activist and a professor of nursing or a recently retired professor of nursing at James Cook University. She was also the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representative on NACAIDS, the National Advisory Committee on AIDS from 1987. Her position on NACAIDS allowed her to play an important political role, advocating for an approach to HIV and AIDS in her community that centered the principles of community control and self-determination. She was instrumental in developing the Condom Man Health Promotion Campaign in 1987 that some people might remember, um, which featured the Aboriginal superhero whose catch cry and public health message, don't be shame, be gay and use condoms, became a defining feature of Australia's HIV and AIDS response across both black and white Australia, and was a highly popular public health campaign throughout Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in both urban and remote areas. Ani Graceland was born into a family of 19. She grew up in a condemned house on the outskirts of racially divided, the racially divided city of Townsville. Her father was a respected community activist who'd been sent as a child to Palm Island, a notoriously brutal mission. And she explained to me in the interview uh, how poverty and racism, but also the resistance and resilience of her family were defining features of her childhood. In 1969, she began her nursing training in Townsville General Hospital and completed it four years later. Now, at the same time that Arnie Graceland was completing her training and moving into the workforce, an Indigenous political rights movement was emerging. Uh, and this was a movement influenced by figures like Malcolm X and the Black Panthers in the US and anti-colonial movements across the global South. This growing Black Power movement emphasised what Gary Foley, a founding member of the Australian Black Panther Party and academic, called a new form of Koori community organisations. And these organisations were first and foremost Aboriginal controlled and were based on the premise that Aboriginal people themselves had the economic, political and cultural resources to confront, confront and solve the challenges facing their communities. Beginning in the inner city communities of Redfern and Fitzroy, Aboriginal run and controlled health and legal services soon spread across the continent. And these ideas influenced a generation of black activists, including Auntie Graceland, who already politicized by her experiences of poverty and racism was drawn to this emerging politics of Aboriginal control. And in 1975, she helped found the Townsville um, Aboriginal and Islanders Health Service and was first registered nurse to work there. By 1981, Annie Graceland was a significant field in, in the area of, sorry, a significant figure in the field of Aboriginal health, a regular speaker at conferences, both nationally and internationally. And importantly, in 85, she, she traveled to the US uh, to attend an international indigenous health conference. And it was there that she realized the significance of HIV when a friend died of the virus during her visit. She returned to Australia concerned about what this could mean for her community. And as the danger posed by HIV was dawning on Auntie Graceland, a significant debate was taking place in the highest offices of Australia's HIV and AIDS response about how best to respond to the virus in Aboriginal communities. In November of 1986, prominent Dr. Dave, David Pennington resigned his permission on NACAIDS, the National Advisory Committee on AIDS. Pennington was 
convinced that the approach to HIV that had been advocated for by the gay community and taken up by the Hawke government, an approach based on community engagement and harm minimization, would fail in Aboriginal communities. Instead, he argued that a medical model of infection control, most significantly the compulsory testing of Aboriginal people, was required. And his resignation came after a bit of few months on the committee in which Pennington was rumoured to have attempted to short circuit NACADES um, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Working Group by holding secret meetings with government, government officials from the Department of Aboriginal Affairs to consider mass antibody testing of Aboriginal people in remote communities. Just months after his resignation, Arnie Grayson waded into this fraught political space as the new Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representative. Importantly, she brought with her the politics and the perspective around the importance of self-determination and community control that she had developed in a decade previously working in Aboriginal controlled health organisations. On July 27 of 1987, and just months into her tenure, Annie Graceland presented in Sydney at the reporting day on AIDS and her paper was circulated within the Department of Aboriginal Affairs. Um, and it's illustrative of the politics behind campaigns like Condom Man and the approach that she was taking and arguing for on NACADES. And you see a little quote there from her paper uh, that, I've, that I've pulled out. And what's very clear, I think, is that the notion of community control was central to this approach. Uh, she's noting that most importantly, health education programs are relevant to particular communities and owned by those communities that develop them. Um, now, in the Northern Territory branch of the National Archives, I found a number of folders from the Federal Department of Aboriginal Affairs, which were full of accounts from this time, from mid-1987 and later, of education programs organised by Aboriginal-run health services in remote communities that seem to put exactly these politics and ideas into practice. Um, I don't think you're going to be able to see, unfortunately, because I can't share the full screen, um, but these are examples from Tennant Creek uh, and from Yindamu, which is a, a Walpura community outside Alice Springs, um, which are, you know, vivid accounts of these programs. So um, in, in um, Tennant Creek, there's stories of elders combining AIDS education with existing cultural and spiritual practices. Um, and from Yindamu, a, rep a report of just how rapidly information uh, was spreading about the virus and how quickly uh, and seriously communities were taking it seriously. And it's hard to say what direct influence Arnie Graceland had on these specific programs. Um, but what is clear is that she was advocating for exactly this approach on NACADES and within the Department of Aboriginal Affairs and that her ideas were being widely circulated. So that paper she wrote was circulated within the Federal Department and across all the, state, um, all the states as well. And so she was giving a voice uh, within the government, you know, within the department, within NACADES to an approach that was developing its own momentum on the ground. Um, but importantly, her contribution was not only at this high level of policy. Uh, the campaign that we now know as Condom Man was Arnie Graceland's first major intervention on NACADES and one in which uh, she put her approach of community control um, and health promotion into practice. Um, and I've got a little, um, I've got a quote here from her that I'm hoping will play successfully um, where you can hear about that story. I was then was asked to go on a national board called NACADES, mm. where Ida, Ida Buttrose was the chair, and uh, I was the Indigenous rep. And um, I didn't know uh, what to expect. And um, I said, uh, well, what do, and they said, we just got to advise the, advise the government uh, about... Um, uh, about sexual infections, but most importantly, HIV AIDS. And I um, I didn't mind it at all because Ida was pretty strict, but I found myself mostly with uh, middle-class white folks who really didn't know our world. And uh, so literally millions of dollars were starting to be poured into the HIV movement. And uh, I suppose it's a bit like today's come up, people started to panic. Mm -hmm. And 
they did this um, uh, uh, consultants for porting engines, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And um, it was really quite scary. And they did a program called the Grim Reaper. Mm. And and uh, I was I was not happy with the Grim Reaper. And I made a comment. And strangely enough, I was listening to you. I said, your world is very different to the Aboriginal world because of the poverty. And I said, I, I need to... Um, let you know that Aboriginal people will not identify with a skeleton and bowling a ball down down an alley. And uh, so they suggested what I should do. And I said, well, I've worked on just about every Aboriginal community in Queensland. I'll leave it there now. Um... But essentially, Annie Grayson was listened to um, and she pulled together a team of health workers and social workers from Aboriginal organisations across Queensland. Uh, and together they visited communities all over the state um, and pulled together materials um, that were then further developed at a workshop in Townsville, attended by community members uh, and elders from a wide cross section of the communities um, represented in the area. And it was from that first tranche of workshops that Condom Man was born. Um, her team of health workers went everywhere in Townsville. They walked up and down the streets, gathering community leaders and elders um, about the program and you know, make, ensuring that it would be a, um, a culturally appropriate program that was accessible uh, to the various communities in the area. Uh, and she recalled this you know, insight, which I just thought summed it up perfectly. Uh, that they talked about the Grim Reaper, that it didn't make sense, that it was frightening for the community, uh, and but that one of the elders says, we can have our own black hero and we'll call him Condom Man. And all of that was being sketched by an artist at the same time, um, and Condom Man, Don't Be Shame, Be Game was born. Uh, and, you know, it was so, the, the campaign was powerful because it combined an affirmative image of indigeneity with a clear safe sex message, and it was used across the continent, incredibly popular campaign. Uh, historian Graham Willett puts it, Condom Man was taken into the hearts of Indigenous communities with posters, T-shirts, and even a real life Condom Man who visited community events, being, bringing the issue of safety vibrantly to life. Uh, and five years later in 1992, hundreds of healthcare workers, community leaders, and public servants gathered for the first Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander HIV and AIDS conference. And despite the sort of surprise intervention of the beloved Fred Hollows at that event, and I'd love to talk about that more, but Fred Hollows got up and called for mass compulsory testing and the forced quarantining of infected individuals, very, unpop you know, very unpopular at the time. The conference um, reaffirmed instead of Hollows' approach, rather a commitment to those principles of community control that Arnie Graceland had been arguing for on NACAIDS all along. And this would become uh, can continue to be the defining approach to the threat of HIV and AIDS among an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities for the remainder of the AIDS crisis in Australia. And it was an extraordinary success. Uh, historian Paul Senzuk points out that in those critical years prior to effective therapy in 1996, um, the rate of HIV infection among Indigenous people in Australia did not rise significantly above that of, non of the non-Indigenous population. Now, Condom Man was just one campaign, and of course, Annie Graceland was just one individual, but the approach that she took on NACAIDS and the success of Condom Man planted a flag in the sand. She demonstrated very clearly that given the appropriate resources, Aboriginal people could and indeed should design and deliver the solutions to the health challenges that they confronted in their communities. And I think, you know, as I started this presentation, we, we've seen the legacy of that in the, in the response to COVID and, and the great success that that's been. But I'll leave it there now. So thanks very much. Thank you, Geraldine. That's just wonderful. So I'm going to pass over to Alicia for five minutes of Q&A with Geraldine, and then we'll bring Warwick and Guy back for a, a Q&A to the whole panel. Thanks, Al, and thanks, Geraldine, and um, 
if ever, anyone wants to add a question into the Q&A box for Geraldine, feel free. And even if you're starting to think about the three speakers as, as a whole and want to start putting questions in there for our final Q&A, feel free to do that. So, um, Geraldine, maybe if you unshare your screen. Oh, yes. There we go. Thank you. And um, I was just thinking through that while we wait for a few questions to come through is even though it's a different situation to what Warwick was talking about, that idea of community knowledge and nuance in modelling, I just felt like what you described uh, Auntie Graceland achieving was exactly that, the community knowledge, ownership and the nuance in the response. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's... Um... That's precisely it. And, um, you know, the point that she made over and over again, and I think was borne out so clearly that, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities have the knowledge and capacity to confront these challenges that just so often under resourced and not given, you know, the, 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 um, the opportunity to do that. And I think she proves so clearly her, her the case of the response that she led in those early years proves so clearly, um, you know, the extraordinary potential for um, for that kind of response. Yeah, but there's that knowledge. Yeah. yeah, and such as being such a strong advocate for her community as well, or communities that she was connected to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, and you were you were talking initially, although we didn't, we don't want to, you know, um, tie too many stories together in history, but. But about the the um, the past twelve months with with dealing with COVID and with Indigenous communities, sort of having that those similarities, you would say? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, really, it, and it also is very much a legacy of the Black Power movement in the seventies, where you have this proliferation of Aboriginal controlled health organisations, and you know, starting in Redfern and Fitzroy, and then moving across the continent, those um, health organisations still exist. And they're the organisations that delivered, um, you know, the response to COVID uh, for communities that has meant it's been so successful. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's such a, it's a profound legacy, I guess, that mm. HIV is part of that legacy, you know, the response to HIV is part of that legacy and now the response to COVID. Yeah. And, and how, how did um, Auntie Graceland do that? How did, how did she manage to win out over Pennington and Hollows as, as Al sent me a question, um, how did the politics play out? Why did they lose? How did yeah. that happen? I think, so look, I would have, there's obviously so much to go into, right? Um, but the, there's a broader context as well, which is a new public health movement. So um, you've got this pushback in the seventies against um, kind of, I guess some of what Warwick's talking about in a way, like those, mm -hmm you know, rigid models of uh, the rigid medical model of infection control and people saying we actually need a social model um, to, to deal with disease. Um, and then HIV comes and it affects the gay community initially, a highly organised political community that insists that the new public health model, in a, you know, at least in Australia, was able to insist that that be what was used uh, for their community um and so that kind of creates a space i guess where um people like arnie graceland already politicized by the black power movement can say you know you're going to do it for them you do it for us to give us the control to actually to, mm -hmm. to manage this ourselves so activism in multiple areas actually yeah. gave it more power yeah yeah absolutely yeah. And there's a question from Christine saying, do you know if there was a similar positive graphic model in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community for COVID? Um, I don't, I haven't, I haven't seen anything. Um, I, I don't, I don't think that nothing that quite matches Condom Man. I no. mean, just uh, pretty, pretty profoundly popular. And also uh, Marvel comics were not happy because it is a, a rip off of the Phantom. Yes. <laughs> It does look very recognisable. Yeah. And an undisclosed amount of money was, in fact, exchanged in exchange hands. Um, oh, okay. From the Love government. It. <laughs> well, I think um, some questions are coming in more for the whole panel now. So I'm going to pass over to Susie and invite Warwick and Guy um, to come back on. Thanks so much, Geraldine, for, for sharing with us and, um, and telling us that story. Thanks so much. Okay.
Yeah, so thanks, Geraldine. Stay there. Susie, Susie Prochke, my colleague at Monash History. Welcome, Susie. Susie's going to chair this final, and we've got 20 minutes for a Q&A with the whole panel. So please do uh, post your questions to the Q&A, and we'll look forward to hearing the responses. Hi, everyone. Thanks for that. Um, I might just start with a question from... Um, Shelley, who says, did the negative response to the idea of universal mandated testing create further mistrust of public health me or medicine? Oh, sorry, I'm, this is not for the whole panel. This is actually a question for Geraldine. That's all right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do that again. Did the negative response to the idea of universal mandated testing create further mistrust of public health among Indigenous communities and change how public health has been carried out since in those communities? Um, so I think, I think because there was such strong leadership from, I'm talking about Annie Graceland today, but of course, there are, you know, many other people, um, but because there was such strong leadership opposing mandatory testing, um, I actually think that it never kind of, uh, became, you know, as much as at a high level, um, people like David Pennington were advocating for it. It never became such a mainstream discussion that I, I don't think it, it did do that. Instead, I think what happened was that the other model won out and enormous trust was built, um, you know, between those, those community controlled organisations and, and the, you know, the people that they were, were working with. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah. Um, and and Guy has a question, which you can just ask out loud because you're here. <laughs> Would you like to do that? I'm, I'm listening uh, carefully and very positively to both, what both Warwick and Andrew have been saying. And I'm arguing um, sort of to play devil's advocate and very much against my own intuition uh, that this bottom-up approach uh, to community health and the insights that it generates um, and the very practical sort of aspects of it. When does, when does that, from a, from a modeling perspective, but also from a, from a technical perspective, when does that stop and uh, we begin to sort of swing into, uh, you know, radical identitarian sort of territory, um, including by the way, anti-vaxxers uh, or, or anti whatever is, the preventative or curative measure that is being, you know, um, central to 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 to, to uh, addressing the problem at hand. Um, do you do you have any ideas about where do we? There is, isn't there a danger, in other words, uh, from uh, of of sort of um, decentralizing this process uh, at some at some point? I'll, um, sorry, I was going to say, Warren, you should answer that. Well, I was going to say, you, you should answer that, Geraldine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to start, and Geraldine will say something more helpful afterwards. Um, but uh, look, uh, there's always that risk, of course. Uh, but um, uh, there's a risk of oversimplification. And this has been a critique of um, uh, many people uh, uh, in relation to, say, you know, the, the cultural explanations for the transmission of AIDS or something, which just oversimplified uh, social life and uh, the cultural context. Uh, Paul Farmer wrote, Paul Farmer's first book, AIDS and Accusation, is all about this uh, in relation to Haiti. Uh, and so I think there is that risk. But I, what I'm arguing, I'm actually arguing that we need more complexity and more heterogeneity in our models, in our understanding of how viruses transmit. In, in effect, what I, I'm doing is actually harking back to Charles Rosenberg's, I think, classic essay, 1992, called, um, uh, well, uh, it's, it's in Epidemics and Ideas. It's the only one of those essays that hadn't already been published somewhere. But in it, he, talk, he distinguishes between contamination models assumptions in the transmission of disease, that contact or defilement means disease, to uh, from, from that from uh, configuration models, where you're looking at ecological, biological and sociological configurations that shape 
how the virus moves around the world. And, uh, and so I think uh, uh, these configurations uh, shouldn't be simplistic or facile or typological, far from it. The problem is when, you know, uh, when people who are modeling want to think about something social, they often do resort to, to very uh, simple uh, modular notions from say social psychology rather than much more complex notions. So I, I don't think that's a, yeah, so I don't think um, identity politics is the problem. I think this is actually a way of moving uh, beyond that and getting much more finely textured analysis of uh, the realities of social worlds and incorporating that in our understanding of disease. And this is something that, you know, historians uh, uh, do anyhow in their our own narratives. So, we could presumably help the modelers with this. So, Warwick, just to play devil's advocate for scientists and, and, and modelers, because um, scientists do disagree among themselves about precisely these kinds of details. Wouldn't, wouldn't people who are working in this field say, we just need to ref better refine our inputs well, I think they do. <laughs> That's what I'm saying too, really. Uh, but I mean, I, I am saying that. I'm not saying do away with models, far from it. I think we need models, but I think the way the models are currently constituted could be improved. And this is exactly, this is a conversation that uh, uh, modelers engage in every day uh, and people in public health. And, and you know, there's, a, there's also a, a, another tension here between the modelers and the people who talk about conventional public health, which is, uh, uh, which is testing, contact tracing, and isolation of cases and contacts. And that sort of thing uh, is uh, contrasted to the models which tend to end up with lockdown. And, and so they end up with a, you could say, if you want to be fancy, a different, a different biopolitics actually. Uh, but I think we, one could change that if the models were more sensitive more sensitive. And I, what I'm saying really is that I'm not so sure about the general public having input, but I'm saying, uh, although, you know, some, at uh, some level, maybe mediated or whatever, it would be good. Uh, but really, there are all sorts of people who know a lot about social life, historians included, who should have be consulted and help make these models better. And, uh, and the history I told you was a history of that sort of expertise being excluded. And you may have noticed I kept on referring to these people, many of them, as physicists. And they're very good at manipulating data, uh, but they don't know much about biology or sociology. Uh, and I think, you know, many of us could, it could help them. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've got uh, a few, um, yeah, well, that's an excellent question there from Christine, who says, how likely are decision makers to listen to historians and sociologists in an age where science and maths are ascendant over the humanities? <laughs> well, I mean, I could have something to say about that too, but I don't want to say too much but uh, at this point but uh, uh, you know I, I've been asked to uh, review papers for the chief scientists rapid research information forum I think it's called uh, which is these are briefing papers that go to Greg Hunt the minister about uh, uh, various aspects of the uh, of the pandemic issues that have come up and uh, and so uh, you know and and I'm actually chairing uh, on a different, slightly different issue, but in terms of uh, historians having some influence over, uh, over health policy making, I'm chairing the steering committee of the Academy of Health and Medical Sciences on the health effects of climate change. So I, th I think actually um, the, these people are quite eager to hear from others who have something, you know, useful to say in a respectful way uh, mm -hmm. about what they do. I, I, I think the, 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 yeah, so I don't, I think the biggest problem I've found is getting people in the humanities 
to speak to these people, not having them listen. I think there's a, there are a lot of scientists and policymakers out there willing to listen, but we don't speak to them enough. Okay. Um, just in the absence of, well, I might just, I might just jump in and um, ask a question of, of Guy here. Guy, you raised the spectre of a very well-known um, scholarship um, amongst medievalists that I enjoy observing as a modern historian, which is the way in which medievalism is wielded in public discourse to try to um, critique things that we consider to be, well, I, I guess really to comment on modernity and backwardness and, and to criticise policies and practices. And I wondered if you'd just like to have a little, um, have a discussion about that um, just for the, the benefit of the audience. Well, right, we don't need a pandemic to, to use the, um, the ultimate pejorative, <laughs> That's right. Uh, right? To other, to other uh, a certain culture or religion or group uh, by calling them medieval um, um, whilst as historians, and we do that as historians too, right? We, we chronologize in ways that we, you know, we don't really believe in, um, or, or more problematic if we do, but I, mean, I think most historians, you know, have a complex relationship with the periodization that are, that are, that we still use, you know, in order to, I don't know, uh, distribute curricular requirements in our schools or in our, in our high schools or in uh, universities. Um, and I don't know. Uh, I mean, I've been warned many times that this is, you know, to go to, a, a, you know, that it's like fighting windmills because we need to self and other, right? These are very sociologically, very common um, uh, mechanisms of identity formation. And so, um, okay, once we jettison medieval and modern or pre-modern and modern or pre-industrial and industrial, whatever, you know, your pick is, uh, we'll come up with other things. I just think that the, that package of medieval, as we've seen with, you know, the op-ed that I, that I started with, is not only full of misunderstanding, it's just such a easy shorthand for, you know, an intersection often of race um, and religion uh, less less so than class, I, I think, in this context, but or gender. But um, I think it's something we somehow need to, as historians, we need to fight against because it's a it's historically wrong, and b it's sociologically, uh, it's intellectually impoverished, and it's sociologically very problematic. Um, and if we continue to use through teaching, through identifying ourselves as you know modernists and medievalists, or modernists and non-modernists then um, you know we're contributing to the to the problem uh, at least uh, implicitly and I'd like to find better ways of um, using using I want to be a you know I want to be a proud medieval historian rather than uh, a defensive one and that's uh, uh, yeah it's something I want to be a, a, a attentive to and a, a colleague of ours in Rhode Island called uh, Kathleen Davis um, actually, when she was visiting Australia, wrote a great paper um, called The Simplex of the Pre, which I'm actually, I happen to be talking about tomorrow at our graduate consortium, because it, it, it just is a convergence of such simplifications that, uh, you know, back, back to Warwick's point, if, you know, if we, if we are the anti-modelers in a way, right, we are the historians, we are the party poopers, we are the people who say, well, it's contingent and it's, um, and it's uh, granular and uh, it's, um, uh, you know, we, 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 we can make that maybe go away, maybe. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a real shame that when in, in I suppose, in, in the public sphere at the moment, when people are sort of reaching for examples from the past, it seems to be in, in this very kind of, in this very sort of shallow uh, sense. And that goes to the point that you finished up with, Guy, about 
the lack of social memory for disasters like pandemics, um, that we lose an empathy with people who came actually not so long before us, sometimes, you know, much, much further in the past. But this question of social memory, and I wonder if I could open that up and, and get the panel to sort of talk about that, that issue. I think that's actually one of the common threads through some of the things that we're talking about here. The importance of um, remembering the experience of other human beings in situations that are actually not that different from ours because they go to the human condition. I mean, I, I could just say that, uh, I mean, I think one of the issues with any sort of constructive critique of modelling is actually just to remind people that, that they are human beings, that we're not talking about a herd. Uh, and even a herd, of course, is not simply a herd. It's much more, much more complex, a collective than that. But, uh, but I, 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 th I think the, you know, this is what we are supposed to do in the humanities is talk about what it means to be human. And I think that's what we can contribute to the way these uh, pandemics are framed. And uh, so we need to remind people about what it means to be human. I have one more question. Um, uh, people from culturally and ling linguistically diverse communities seem to bear the brunt of the second wave in Melbourne. Could the success of the Aboriginal Health Service be replicated in those communities? That's a great question, really. I mean, it's about, I suppose, the decentralisation of the health response, of the public health response, isn't it? Um, yeah. Could that success be replicated elsewhere? Or is the structure just not there yet? Yeah, that that's a really interesting question. I think, I think it's, like, it's true, it absolutely could be. And I think... Um, yeah, the, the experience of what happened in the second wave in Melbourne and, and yeah, people uh, mentioned earlier the, the, you know, really quite brutal lockdown of the public housing towers, I think is an example of, I guess, exactly what, what um, Warwick's talking about in terms of a, a kind of modelling that doesn't acknowledge the humanity of people and the social being of people. Uh, and I think, you know, if you compare and, and look at what was successful in Australia and, and actually not just in terms of the Aboriginal community controlled health response, but also the gay community, IV drug users, sex workers, um, was that they, instead of looking at models <laughs> and models alone, which said essentially, like if you took in the most brutal way, the model and applied it to HIV, which places in America did, it was stop gay men having sex with each other and that means closing the bars uh, and that didn't work <laughs> like that was that was a brutal response that failed absolutely what they did in Australia uh, in not just among gay men but you know Aboriginal communities like I've talked about today IV drug users and sex workers was actually to say what are the social interactions at play here how can we help people to do things in safe ways or change their behavior in ways that are agreeable to them um, how can we actually meet people where they're at in their social lives and their habits and what they do and, and, and give them the power and the control to make those changes? And it worked. And I think you could have done that with the public housing towers. Uh, and part of that, you know, would have, yeah, there's also deeper social issues there, right, with the, the towers, for example. Like, why wasn't there um, an infrastructure of health already set up that could deal with that and stop that from happening why were there lifts, you know, that were so crowded that people were, you know, constantly, there was, you know, there's no proper cleaning of those lifts and those kinds of things. Um, but I think, yeah, in terms of the general sense, it absolutely could be applied, but it's about that community control that meets people where they're at. Um, do we have time for any one more question? I think we're probably there, Susie. It's six thirty, so we probably need to wind it up there. And but we keep an eye on those questions, and we can always deal with them informally. So, look uh, before we leave. Let me just share my screen again to give a little bit of information. Um, and I'll just.
Look, before I do, I'll just come here first. Um, look, first of all, I just want to say thanks to the organising team, my colleagues, but also to our three speakers for three really riveting uh, talks. I really got a sense from the talks and the questions and the Q&A just about how historians can, and can contribute a really rich understanding of social and historical context and contingency and also can show us how politics works to shape public health responses and how that's happened in different historical contexts. Um, I just want to say, just before we finish off, a couple of thoughts. One, we're really grateful to Monash University Publishing that supports this seminar series, and they'll be making contact with our three presenters, giving them an opportunity to get a, a gratis copy of their, their preferred uh, Monash University publication. So normally we'd hand them over face to face, but this will happen remotely. And I just want to also bring people's attention to the next Making Public Histories uh, webinar, which obviously will in many ways connects onto this on populism, democracy and COVID with Peter, Peter McPhee, Imogen Saunders and John Pacini. And you can see the link there, but if you just go to the History Council of Victoria website, you can register uh, to join us again. So again, thank you to our presenters. Thank you to the team. And thank you all of you who've shown up and joined this discussion, made your contributions with questions. It's been really interesting. And I look forward to welcoming, welcoming, welcoming you back again to the next webinar. So thanks and good night.